Um, and welcome everyone. Um, I would like to express a deep thanks to the Heartland Institute for uh, sponsoring this important forum and welcome all our guests here at Heartland and also those on the web in, in their beautiful new building. I have experience with um, the Heartland. Um, they are the engine that steps up and fills the void in the most important issues facing this country. Uh, we went to Rome um, to uh, protest the Vatican Climate Change Conference and the Heartland Institute was all over the New York Times, the Boston Globe. We had two press conferences that were packed to the guild, and the message came out loud and clear only because the Heartland was there. So this is, this is an organization that is going to lead on a lot of issues. My name is Elizabeth Yore. I was weaned on politics, so I am really looking forward to this Women in Politics um, conference. You know, it was Margaret Thatcher who said, and you know, what other great politician, world politician is there, but Margaret Thatcher said in politics, if you want anything said, you ask a man. If you want anything done, you ask a woman. So today, Today we have brought this very impressive panel of women who are going to talk at very different perspectives on politics, bringing an enormous amount of experience, education um, on the issues of women in politics. And in 2016, this is an issue that is going to be dominating the airwaves, the internet, and everything else. Um, every time we pick up a paper, it's going to be politics. For the first time in the history of the United States, we have a record of 108 women currently in Congress. So it is a time when women are going to be dominating the political atmosphere. Our first speaker today, and just I'm going to mention housekeeping only once, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we're going to have the three speakers talk, and then afterwards we'll open it up for questions. So get your questions ready after each speaker talks. And if there are questions from the uh, web, we encourage you also to submit your questions. Our first speaker, um, State Representative Jeannie Ives, has been a public servant all her life. Um, from the moment she entered West Point um, in her years in service as a public servant in state and local government. Um, she is, in, I, you can see her impressive resume in the Women in Politics flyer we have tonight out in front of you. Um, she is a mother of five. She is a advocate and great staunch advocate on behalf of women, children, her constituents in Wheaton and um, in the 42nd District. Yes. yes. And I am, I have heard her on Amy's show. I'll, plug for, uh, I'll be plugging Amy's show because, um, I, 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 no, no, I, I, I wanted to say tonight the um, Dan and Amy show, we have the better half today. Tonight. We have Amy Jacobson tonight. Um, so, um, it's such an honor to um, introduce to you uh, State Representative Jeannie Ives. Um, after high school, I entered West Point looking for a challenge and a desire to be all I could be. Women made up about 10% of the core at that time, but that didn't discourage me or I believe most of my fellow female classmates. See, we grew up in an era of Title IX, working mothers with high expectations for their daughters, and the women's liberty movement in full swing. It wasn't until after I graduated that I did the math and realized that a woman attending the academy was still relatively uncommon in 1983. I was fortunate, and I'm grateful to have had the opportunity to attend a distinguished institution like West Point. My contemporaries and I, like women enrolled in the academy today are beneficiaries of the courageous women who had the foresight, tenacity, and perseverance to stand up for themselves and their beliefs and to fight for the country and citizenship that they envisioned. 
from the era of women's suffrage to the era of Rosie the Riveter, those women defined themselves first by their accomplishments and then demanded equal treatment for they knew their capabilities and contributions were equal to or greater than many of their counterparts. And I truly believe that I stand before you here tonight with a unique perspe perspective on women in politics. See, my formation as a young 18-year-old in the bastion of male dominance was certainly, has certainly played a role in how I view the male-dominated field, field of politics and how I work in that field today. And I can clearly remember the day as a plebe when I felt maybe women didn't belong at West Point. And I have been through more than one occasion of sexual harassment, the likes of which you would not believe. But I can also clearly remember when I realized that indeed I did belong at West Point and in the Army, in some cases more so than my male peers. But you may find it surprising that the truth is that the day that I realized such that I belong there was when I took hold of the fact that I could physically outperform my male peers. You see, the Army and men in general respect physical toughness. And if you can prove yourself there, the rest really is easier. From better scores on military tasks like land navigation to better scores in the classroom, it is your individual capability on which you should be judged. And then, when you know you have put in the work and are just as capable, it becomes much easier to confront those who would push you aside or not listen to you. So I realized that yes, I am just as capable as, capable as those with XY chromosomes, and I never looked back. But you will not hear me lead with the argument of, um, I am woman, hear me roar, and a Hel Helen Reddy refrain. Because even now, when political consultants look to run a candidate based on gender, depending on a district's demographics, I cringe. And when politicians ask me to be on their women for, insert whatever name, event, I try to politely decline. The more we let others separate us by our gender, notwithstanding bathrooms, the more they will. <laughs> that said, there is no denying that politics is largely a male-dominated field, and getting around that requires women to be assertive, smart, informed, and honest. Women need to know who they are as a person and what they wish to accomplish. And I'm just going to give you an illustration. But before I begin, I must say, that I speak to you here tonight as an elected official only because well-respected, accomplished men asked me to join the political fight. No woman politician came to me and suggested I run for city council or state representative. In both cases, it was men who invited me into the conversation and supported my candidacy. My first experience with the Old Boys Network, though, however, was in my first run for state rep during the primary and was a classic example of men and their egos at work. I ran in a four-way primary with all other three candidates having far more political connections than I. During that race, I was asked to a meeting with the county chairman, who was a male, and also one of the other male candidates. There, these men who had political connections stretching back decades suggested that they would give me an easier shot to winning the primary we have, by having this particular male candidate step aside from that primary race if I would ask my female friend running in a county race to step aside so he could run in that race instead. Now, my political naivety ended right there. I walked away and I told them I don't tell my friends what races to get in and out of and I will win, win this race on my own. And then my girlfriends and I sitting around my dining room table ran our campaign and won. You see, women who have answered the why they are running for office will have a fair shot at winning any office. For years, I looked at that experience from the perspective of a woman. Having encountered male bullies before, I assumed this was one more example. Now I know, though, through wider political experience, that political bullies do not pick their target based on gender. As male candidates I know have also been asked to leave races or cut deals, but I believe women are probably seen as easier to intimidate or pressure in the political arena. But now let me turn to my time in the legislature and my political experience there as a woman. And there are definitely those sets of bills that women are expected to sponsor and vote for. But this is a dangerous assumption really on my side of the aisle and especially for me. Everything from insurance mandates for female specific medical issues to workplace requirements like equal, 
equal pay laws, extensive paid maternity leave, and pregnancy accommodation come up to the, in the legislature. The pressure to vote for laws that are related to your gender are there. In one case, though, I had to square my knowledge of accommodations the military made for pregnant women with a bill designed to help pregnant women in the civilian workplace. The Army has very generous accommodations for pregnant soldiers, including all sorts of restrictions for physical activity, non-deployability at the second trimester, and six weeks paid maternity leave. The House legislation requiring employers to make reasonable accommodations for pregnant employees, such as providing a stool in lieu of standing in a checkout line if they are a checker, or more frequent bathroom breaks um, became problematic. And this is because the legislation was a little bit open-ended. And with profits on the line for businesses that are struggling in Illinois and knowing that we had a culture of business problems in Illinois, our Republican caucus was largely opposed to the bill. Personally though, I had a tough time squaring that with my personal experience as a military person who was pregnant and the recipient of lenient rules while pregnant in the military. So I decided to provide the sponsor of the bill, who is a very liberal Democrat, and this was a very important bill to her. I provided her with all the information that, on the military and what they provided to their female soldiers that are pregnant. And I let her make the argument for herself on the floor. So in some ways, you know, I did vote present on that bill. And on the passage of that bill the first time through, there were only two Republicans that even voted yes for it and the rest of them held off of it. I could, not, I could not square my own personal experience with needing accommodations or having had that as a woman and not voting for this bill. So I did go present on that one, one of the few present votes that I've taken. But such are the ways that a woman finds herself in in the political realm. Men do not have to make those types of decisions. But. The real conversation really needs to turn to leadership. So let's face it, politicians who challenge the status quo are the real threat to those who want to keep the current system in place. That's why someone who's knowledgeable, accomplished, principled, tenacious, and most of all authentic will make a bigger impact and can win the day. And that's why Hillary, Hillary Clinton has a problem. And that's why she now needs to make the debate not about her accomplishments, not about her inauthenticity. She needs to make it about gender. And that's why this is going to be the forefront of the in the election all the way through 2016. But really, we stand now on the cusp of this election where the Democrat front runner believes her big, biggest asset for the presidency of the United States is that she's a woman. We must reject that notion. We cannot, as women, allow gender to be the distinguishing factor in capturing the highest political office in our nation. In my opinion, to do so means the failed policies that would inevitably come with the Hillary, Hillary presidency will taint the future runs of women for decades in the future. So our role as women must be only judged by the merits of our background, personal character, and accomplishments. And I say this both as a mother of four sons and one daughter. Thank you. Thank you, Jeannie. Our next speaker, I'm sure many of you are early risers like I am, um, so you have no excuse. If you want to be an informed voter, if you want to have cutting edge information on all the issues of the day, state, local, national, and international, you must listen to 560. The Amy Jacobson and what's the other guy's name? Dan, Dan Prof show. Um, Amy and Dan provide Illinois voters and listeners with a fascinating morning ride um, of all sorts of information. In fact, I hate to say it, but this morning it was Charlie Sheen for about a few a few minutes, and occasionally the Kardashians. But generally, it's hard. But generally, it's hard hitting fascinating facts, policy, information that every voter in Illinois needs to hear. It's such a pleasure to introduce Amy Jacobson. Got to raise this up because I'm very tall. The shortest in my family, though. Yes, 
Thank you. My mom's six too. Um, so I'm a recovering Democrat. I come to you as as a friend to you know accept me and just know that it's been a 12-step process. In 2008, I did vote for Hillary Clinton in the primary, of course, because she didn't make it to the general. We know that. And what I thought, you know, about Hillary that attracted me, oh, she's from Park Ridge. She used to be a Republican when she was at Maine South High School, very involved in politics. And I thought she watched her husband do his job for two terms and thought, you know what? I can do a better job than him. She studied every name of world leaders. She memorized their children's names. And, she, you know, I don't agree with her politically, but I thought maybe, you know, she's competent. Maybe it'd be different to have a woman's ego in the White House. All right. So I supported her. But then they put up this guy named Barack Obama, who I've known for a long time, just because when I worked at Channel 5, we did a number of events together. We worked out at the same gym. He would, you know, he's, he, I know a lot of you in this room do not like him politically, but as a human being, as a father, he's a good man, but I could not support him. I, there, I have seen, I, he was not ready for this job. And I don't think he wakes up, a lot of my conservative uh, radio hosts wake up, think or that Obama wakes up every morning and says, how can I destroy this country? I honestly don't think that he wakes up and says that. I just don't think that he's prepared for this job. He got in over his head. He had David, Ax, David Axelrod and others say, you know what, now's your time, just do it. We're going to stick it to the Clintons. Let's just do this. So he wasn't prepared. It's showing in a number of aspects from foreign policy to our national security. He's not doing his job. So now we have to focus on somebody who can beat Hillary Clinton in the general election because, let's face it, she's going to get the nomination. Who here is supporting Ben Carson? Okay. Who here is supporting Senator Ted Cruz? Who here is supporting Jeb Bush? Who here is supporting Marco Rubio? Did I miss anybody? Don, oh, how could I, I, I? Just kidding. Who's I know. Who here is supporting Carly Fiorina? Two. And what about Donald Trump? All right. So a lot of anybody still undecided. I'm still candidate shopping, and I, you know, I go through like dating periods. Like, oh, I'm kind of attracted to him. I do a little dance with him. I did a little dance with Carly, and I'm still undecided. But uh, we have some time here, and that's why we're here tonight to discuss public policy, foreign policy, national security, and who is the best candidate to beat Hillary Clinton. So thank you so much for uh, inviting me here. Again, our show, the Amy Jacobson and Dan show. No, uh, the Dan Proft and Amy Jacobson show is heard from 5 a.m. to 9 a.m. Monday through Friday. Who listens? I do, because they pay me to. No, I would listen anyway. Dan Proft, I've learned so much from him. Um, it's kind of like an arranged marriage, but we're getting along okay. We've had a few bumps in the road, but I learned, uh, the bottom line is I learned so much from him. He is the smartest person I know, um, and he's really, he really knows his stuff, and he's very stubborn, too. He does not change his mind, whereas I change my mind a lot. So thank you so much for having me here tonight. I really appreciate it, and I look forward to our question and answer session. I'm as short as my mother. <laughs> I claim I'm 5'1", but I think it's disputed. Our next speaker is Kathleen Murphy from the Illinois Opportunity Project. Um, I think it, it also has something to do with Dan Prof, I'm told. Kathleen's their communications director. They are, do, they are doing some amazing issues and bringing these issues to light in Illinois. And the topic for Kathleen tonight is the new generation of voters. And as you can see, she's not only beautiful, young, but she is a very talented communicator. Here's Kathleen Murphy. What would you think if I told you that the next generation in American politics would be a generation of free marketeers? Now, I realize that that might be a stretch when we, every week we see a new episode of Liberals Gone Wild on college campuses across the nation. But 
Reason.com recently conducted a study that found when asked to choose the best economic system, and they described each system, they didn't just say free market or socialist because, you know, we don't like labels. Um, but in this study, 64% of millennials identified a free market system as the best economic system. The study concluded that while millennials like the market-based economic system in principle, they aren't sure if markets are the best way to improve their lives. And that uncertainty is a big factor in their outsized support for government action. See, millennials came of an impressionable political age during the worst economic recession since the Great Depression. A third of them are living at home with their parents. Gallup has reported that one in three young adults are underemployed, that 46% of millennials believe that they will be worse off than their parents' generation, and only 16% believe that they're going to be better off. For a lot of young people who haven't experienced or observed market-driven success, government action appears to be a viable alternative to improving the quality of their lives. Across the nation, it's an overwhelming sense of disappointment and a pessimistic view of the future that seems to be bridging the generation gap in spite of eight years of the Hope and Change administration. We are witnessing a new generation, not just a new generation in American politics, but a new attitude towards American politics. Just look at the 2016 presidential race. There is an intense interest in non-traditional candidates, the political outsiders. People know that what we've had, career politicians, cronyism, big government in bed with big business, it isn't working. The quality of their lives has been declining for years now. They are demanding something new. And, and, and they're willing to consider somebody that's been outside of the political establishment over the experience of a Bush or a Clinton. Um, during the Fox Business debate, Carly Fiorina nailed it when she said, the truth is government has been growing bigger and bigger, more corrupt, less effective, crushing the engine of economic growth for a very long time. This isn't just about replacing a Democrat with a Republican now. This is about actually challenging the status quo. Voters from both parties are fed up. They're tired of career politicians and broken promises. For liberals who are supporting Bernie Sanders, they're tired of being told they'll get a minimum wage increase and it never happening. For conservatives who are supporting Donald Trump or Ben Carson, they're tired of being told they're going to get a tougher stance on immigration or, or a repeal of Obamacare and it never, ever happening. Whether the issue is trade, tax policy, minimum wage, corporate regulation, abortion, school prayer, or super PACs, the voter loses nearly every time and they are tired of losing to those with more influence and clout. The rise of the outsiders is a result of frustration. It should serve as a lesson to both parties about what can happen when they ignore their voters. The success of Donald Trump, Bernie Sanders, Carly Fiorina, and Ben Carson represent the real friction between the American people and the political class. But under the right conditions, that friction can ignite a new generation in American politics. And that friction can ignite an opportunity to unleash liberty and the opportunity that it provides in our state and in our nation. On November 9th, Ed Morrissey reported in HotAir.com that a new poll from a Democrat pollster showed that the risk for the left is actually much greater than assumed. The poll showed that while there's a, an opportunity for Democrats to take over the Senate in 2016, millennials, a key demographic, are barely engaged in the election. In the article, Morrissey states, Hillary Clinton has been around Washington, D.C. for 23 years and counting. Nancy Pelosi and the Democrat leadership team has been around longer than that. How does one sell Hillary and Pelosi as the vanguard of reform? Barack Obama could make that claim in 2008 because of his youth and his relative detachment from Washington, D.C. Without that kind of candidate, Democrats become the party of the status quo, and that is not going to sell among the rising American electorate. Republicans, however, have several routes to making themselves the reform option. In this election, our challenge and our opportunity is to make a compelling case for free markets and to introduce the optimism that is born of the only economic system in the world that has ever lifted one billion people out of poverty and raised the standards of living globally. So how do we capitalize on this opportunity? And what, since this is a women in politics panel, what is the role women will play? And this is an important question for Republicans because in the last election, we got it all wrong. In 2012, the Obama campaign, while beating the drum of the war on women, released an infographic featuring a woman they called Julia, who, who, to illustrate the key role that they believe government should play from cradle to grave in a woman's life. This was a depressing, insulting view of women as helpless, isolated wards of the state. It was very revealing of the liberal mentality towards women, and it should have been resoundingly rejected by American women. But conservatives missed the opportunity to present a strong, contrasting view for the vision of uh, the role of government in a woman's life. 
Julia didn't just represent women's issues, Julia represented liberty issues. Republicans failed to push back effectively against Julia and the larger war on women and it was a missed opportunity. The very premise of a war on women is that women always benefit when government grows and assumes more power and that women always suffer when government frees people to make their own decisions. The war on women ignores the real effects that policy has on women's lives and on our opportunities. But more than that, it was meant, it wasn't just meant to tilt the American people towards one set of policy ideas or another, it was meant to silence debate, casting those who disagreed, who believe in limited government as sexist. The attack needed a strong response that demonstrated our belief that not only are women capable, intelligent, and caring, but that they are also powerful forces in the economy. And it needed to advance the truth that the real threat to women's advancement and security is a government that discourages job creation through overregulation and taxation, a government that disincentivizes the family, a government that subsidizes an inherently flawed education system, or a government that advances a costly and ineffective health care system. We have to push back hard against these limiting ideas and speak with moral clarity about women's issues and all issues, not just fiscal issues, because those who peddle big government won't stop. And then we need to make the case for free market solutions. And as women, we can be particularly effective messengers for this cause. A study on decision-making and values by Emily Ankins of the Reason Foundation and Jonathan Haidt, who's famous for his research on liberals versus conservatives, examined the roles that systemizing versus empathizing, reason versus empathy, played in the decision-making process of liberals, conservatives, and libertarians. They found that empathy was the dominant value for both liberals and conservatives, liberals to a greater extent, but really there was not that much of a difference between the two. Libertarians, on the other hand, operated almost entirely on reason, except for libertarian women, who the study found demonstrated a natural tendency toward empathy on key issues. So they concluded that for libertarians, learning to empathize might be a, a more effective way to convert people to a liber liberty-oriented mindset. Nina Whitfield, founder of a, an organization that I'm involved with called the Ladies of Liberty Alliance, took it one step further. Her conclusion was that because of their natural tendency toward empathy, libertarian women can make a more appealing case to conservatives, independents, and persuadable Democrats. And therefore, it's women who will be critical to building liberty within the Republican Party and in orienting the next generation to the causes of liberty and economic freedom. So how's that for girl power? <laughs> now, we as women might be the most effective vehicles for the message, but we have to get the message right in the first place. Now I'm here tonight as a representative of the Illinois Opportunity Project. Our work is to train what we call liberty leaders, candidates, activists, legislators, community leaders, to advocate for free market ideas. Illinois Opportunity Project was founded by John Tillman, Pat Hughes, and Dan Proft. Dan, who um, is one of the smartest people we know, he's able to hang in with the three of us on an almost <laughs> daily basis, so pretty good. It's pretty good. Um, he has developed a challenge that we ask everyone we work with to take up. He believes that our task, in terms of the conversation we have to have in 2016, is to define not just what we're going to do, but to define why we're going to do that. And you may have heard him talk about it. The idea comes from Simon Sinek, an ad exec, who said, people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. So when you hear Republicans talk about candidates, you hear credentials, what he does, where she went to school, or what they're going to do when they're elected, cut taxes, cut government, rain in spending. It's all about what we're going to do, and we rarely define why. So think about it. Why are you a Republican? Why are you a Libertarian? Why are you at a Heartland event on a Wednesday night when you could be home watching Modern Family? That's what people need to know to buy into what you're doing. And you need to lead with that. Now, I've had to think about this because I get it all the time from my college girlfriends or from liberal family members who I think are planning an intervention, actually. <laughs> You're a young woman. Republicans are old men. They don't want to help you. Or So you think my boss shouldn't have to pay for my birth control? That was a tough conversation. Or, or my favorite, are you doing this to meet men? <laughs> it's enlightened, right? Enlightened, yes. So I assure you I'm not, and so I will share with you why I, as a woman, as a single mother, actually do what I do. And on behalf of the Illinois Opportunity Project, I invite you and I challenge you to do the same. So here it is. A few years ago, when I found myself a single mom, 
I needed to go back to work full time. And like a lot of people, I needed someone to take a chance on me. I'll be forever grateful to Jeannie Ives who took that chance and made me her legislative aide. It was the best way to go into politics in Illinois, if you have to go into politics in Illinois. <laughs> when we lost my dad suddenly, we relied on the strength of our family and our faith, but we were also lifted up by the kindness of friends, coworkers, and neighbors. I do what I do because I don't want the government to intrude on our lives so much that we lose our sense of responsibility to each other. I believe that we were meant to care for each other, not to turn our loved ones over to a homogenized bureaucracy. It's not the government's job to help my brother or my daughter or my grandmother. That's my job. That's not to say that there's no role for government creating a safety net to help people through times of trouble, but we shouldn't accept the idea of government as our key source of security. I do what I do because I haven't given up on the concept of Americans as a free, independent people who are capable of taking care of themselves and each other. Karen Lewis, the president of the Chicago Teachers Union, once said this, we cannot be held responsible for the performance of the children in our classrooms because too many of them come from poor and broken families. As a single mother, I'm horrified by that mentality. Each year in Chicago, we send 400,000 students into a school system that will fail to bring the majority of them to grade level achievement by June. Liberals like Karen Lewis might be prepared to dismiss and disregard children because of their circumstances, but I'm not. I do what I do because I know that no one of us is better than any other of us, and I know that each of us has been given unique gifts and talents, and that every child in CPS and across the nation has great potential. I want to help unlock that potential. I want to see children realize a better life than the one they were born into. A feminist is a woman who lives the life she chooses. She may have five children and choose to homeschool them. She may be a leader in government like Jeannie or work in the media like Amy. I do what I do because I know that our principles, the principles of liberty and freedom, are what will lift women up so they can live the lives they choose, lives of dignity and purpose, which is what everyone, women and men, want. The next generation, the generation that embraces free market principles, the generation that's rebelling against the status quo of career politicians, will have arrived when every woman and man can decide for themselves how to best find and use their God-given gifts. That generation is willing to listen. They are willing to consider new ideas. It's up to us to be the messenger, speaking with clarity, enthusiasm, and substance about the ideas of liberty and the opportunity it creates. It's up to us to show the next generation the path to a better future with optimism, intelligence, and authenticity. If we can do this, then the next generation will be a generation of free marketeers. Thank you. The future looks great, doesn't it, with people like Kathleen in charge? Um, and I, she also um, let slip um, something that I think I certainly noted was um, women helping women, Jeannie, um, uh, opening doors for Kathleen. Now comes, um, and I'm going to accuse Jim Lakely of being um, the Phil Donahue. <laughs> we're going to have we're going to have we're going to have questions from the audience, and I'm sure after these wonderful women who have spoken, who all of them have their pulse on the people. They know what the people are asking. They talk to the people. They're out there um, listening, as Amy does every morning. Uh, Jeannie in her work um, in Springfield and in Wheaton, and Kathleen working uh, among young people and communicating new ideas to the public. Um, so what are your questions for our um, panel today? Something that was touched on was about the apathy or people who are really turned off from politics. And I think that that is a challenge that we have when you want to talk about politics and the immediate response is, no, no, don't want to hear it. I will turn the channel. I will not pay attention to it at all. How do we reach those people who are tuned out? That would be my children, but they have no choice because 
In the morning, the first thing that goes on is the Dan and Amy show, and they listen to Dan and Amy during breakfast time, so they cannot tune it out in my family. They just know that that's the way it is. Um, but you're right, there's a ton of people. I mean, the, the, statistically speaking, in primary elections or your municipal elections, you're getting 20% or less voter turnout. Um, even in a presidential cycle, you're typically getting, what, 56%, so there's a lot of disaffected voters, people who don't care. I run into them all the time. Either that or I say, you know what, Jeannie, you're doing a great job, way to go. Keep up the good work, but we're out of here in three years. So, you know, we're, they're not engaged at all. So, um, <clears throat> in my opinion, and, and Kathleen can maybe talk about this too as a millennial, but um, until the bad policy bites them in the butt, they're not going to wake up. It's the same thing kind of with the budget crisis we have in the state of Illinois. You know, right now, at least in my county, you know, that most people are not feeling the effects of it. There are some, but not the broader sense of them. And certainly not state employees, everybody's getting paid. So I really think until um, you know, CPS really is de facto in default in February and they have no money and they have to send it, you know, 5,000 teachers off the, the status, the employment status, I think you know, for most of these people, until it gets personal, it doesn't matter, unfortunately. My kids go to CPS, and we have uh, three special ed teachers who will be let go, but the special ed students are going to remain. So it's going to be a big problem. But my two children, God bless them, um, were the only two kids. They had a mock election, and out of 875 kids, there were two of the three who voted for Mitt Romney. <laughs> So uh, I think I'm raising them right. But I also have some family members, you know, who are older. Uh, I don't want to, I'm not going to call, you know, call out people, but who had never registered to vote, and they were in their mid-40s. And, you know, women have all these, you know, cabbie parties and Stella jewelry, is that what you call it? Well, I wanted to have a, an election register to vote party. And I kind of did. I, uh, I didn't tell them that that's what I was doing, my underlying theme of the evening. Yeah, let's go get a drink. Oh, here, you should register to vote. And that explained to them how important their vote is and really wondered why they had not never registered to vote. And one woman told me, well, my husband does that. And I said, no, 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 you're going to do that. So she's taken charge, and now she's registered to vote and actually voted. So, you know, it's an ongoing process, but you're never too late to register to vote. So just remember that. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I, it is, it's a difficult question. It doesn't have a lot of, you know, a really easy answer. I think part of it is people need to feel like you have tapped into something that they believe in and they are resp I think we're seeing that right now that Republican candidates are generating a lot of heat there's a lot of interest in what they're saying because they've tapped into especially the outsiders the anger that people are feeling as a result of so I think authenticity from candidates is really um, probably going to drive voter turnout more than anything else more than I mean, of course ground games and, and grassroots efforts are really important as well but I think um, an authentic candidate who taps into what where people really are is going to drive it more than anything else I should establish my bias first off number one Ms. Ives I graduated from the Citadel. <laughs> West Point of the South. Actually, we refer to West Point as the Citadel of the North. <laughs> we forgive you for that. But more importantly, in light of the two ladies, and I mean tough, as hard as you can get, who just became Rangers, the question is, do they get assigned to a combat unit? And for that, I refer to an unfortunate individual by the name of Bo Bergdahl, who, in our attempts to rescue him, we lost several of our best troops. If this were a female, how many of our troops, they would die to a man to bring her back? Um, you ever see the movie G.I. Jane? I know the story because I was the chief prosecuting attorney for the United States Air Force in the last years of the Vietnam War, upon which that film was built. They wanted to treat a woman going through, we called it snake school. It was to show 
and demonstrate to our pilots how to survive. It got out of hand, big time. But it made the point. How do we, in your view, integrate women, or should we even attempt to integrate women into the combat forces? So, you know what, I am the perfect person to respond to this question. No, on a very personal level. No, I, honestly, here's the deal. So the two women West Pointers, my son went through ranger school with them and he did not make it on the same swamp phase that they did. Now he made it straight through Darby phase, mountain phase, went to swamp phase, got recycled. Went back to swamp phase a second time, was ended up in the same swamp phase as those two women. He went through with those women. I know personally and in, in, intently exactly what went ha happened down there. Because I heard this, I flew down t for that graduation that he was not part of, but his classmates were. And then later on, they had a luncheon for those West Point women. I met both of them, along with all my West Point classmates. They had a huge, not my, all my classmates, but a whole contingency of West Point women came down to support those women on that thing. That was not why I was there. I was there for my son. I happened to find out that there was a luncheon later on, because I would actually, like, allow this story, like, West Point women, women for Rauner, women for this. I don't do that. I just don't do it. One, I'm just way too busy. I just really, I'm way too busy, don't really. The other thing is I'm not going to be a defend, defend, uh, de defined as the West Point woman. I'm not going to be. So I went down there and found out a whole lot of stuff, and I'm not going to share, share most of it with you. But I will say this. From my son, Matt, uh, after going through three days of intensive discussion with him about everything that he went through, I will tell you this. I think it's... Um, Pretty much there's a lot of circumstances that happen. There's a lot of subjectivity. And there's a lot of um, um, group dynamics that, make a, that factor into who gets through that and who doesn't. But Matt's bottom line was those women deserve to make it through ranger school. That's what he told me. And he was there with them. All right? Now, I also have a son at West Point. He's in the top of his class. So... I asked them, too, when this came up, Women in Combat, about two years ago, and actually was on Dan's show when he was on WLS about this thing. And I said, I asked my boys, what do you say? And my one son, who's now in, actually Matt is back in Ranger School right now. We should find out tomorrow how he's progressing in the Darby phase. We just got a letter today, his first letter. The second time he talked us back way into, back into Ranger School, he is there right now in, in Georgia. Um, and Matt said, Mom, there's no way that, you know, a 120-pound woman can pull my 240-pound body or 220-pound body out of a foxhole. And my other son, the West Pointer, Nick, said, hey, let them do it. If they can do it, great. I don't care. It's fine with me. So that's what those two different perspectives from the two men that are in it now. My perspective is, one, women are in combat. Women are in combat, and if anybody denies it, they're absolutely crazy. The women flying the combat missions in the Apache attack helicopters through the mountains of Afghanistan blind, blind, with nothing but a radar screen to, to, to weave their way through during the darkness of the night as they deploy troops, they are in combat. So let's recognize the fact that they are in combat. Now, whether or not they're going to go into an infantry unit, and who knows, I think these, the women and the, the ranger women that I met, they're going straight back to the unit. One's an aviation pilot, the other one's an MP, military police. They're not, they weren't necessarily looking, I think, to go into a ranger unit. And even my son now, as we sit here, ranger school has become a personal challenge to him. He is not scheduled to go necessarily to a ranger battalion. He's actually scheduled to go for, to Fort Wainwright to a uh, striker battalion. Um, but it, it becomes a personal challenge and a... Uh, something to go through that makes you grow as a person, and it's also about leadership and skills. So it, it um, I, I mean, I think we just face that women are in combat. Whether or not they should be fully integrated into the lowest level infantry squad, I don't know. Um, the other thing about, you know, the Bo Bergdahl issue and going after women to the last thing, yeah, sure, I think that they would go after for the women. Definitely, there's no chase. I mean, but that's what we did, in Af we already did that in Iraq. When the wayward and I was a transportation officer, so convoys are one of the most dangerous things that you do. And it's transportation back, 
you know, back operations, transportation off, uh, convoys that can get caught up in a combat situation when you go astray in a desert situation where there's no landmarks and no signage. And that's exactly why we went off to um, um, PFC Lynch and rescued her with Special Forces officers. Raiders. We're going after any of our men, woman or man. We're going to do it. And so I think that, that that's just my perspective on all of this. And it, uh, the, the problem with the military right now is that it's getting way too politically correct, way too. And we have a commander who does not understand rules of engagement or strategic deployment of forces. That's me. We gotta get some more. Um, on the political stage, um, and what role um, should women, Jeannie, you might want to, um, want to address this issue of terrorism, um, the immigration, um, those issues that have all of a sudden, and this can happen in politics, you know, in a matter of 24 hours, all of a sudden there's major issues that we hadn't anticipated and weren't talking about. As women, how would you want to address that? You know what I'm, well, I know what I'm getting for Christmas. I'm getting a new 38 caliber handgun. I already have one. No, I'm kidding. I, I, have, I have a Ruger. I have a Ruger already. Um, no, I just so women's role in, in what's going on in Paris and our attack on ISIS, we need, we need a co collective group to attack ISIS, and we need our leaders to stand up and call them radical jihadists, call them what they are, and then create a plan. We don't have a plan. FBI said tonight, I don't know if you heard the latest news, that over the holidays, ISIS is planning an attack here on American soil. I don't know if you heard the news, but the bomb that blew up that Metrojet, the Russian Metrojet, was a pineapple soda can, just like a Coca-Cola can. So that was been, that somebody brought that onto the plane and ignited it. So these are scary times that we're living in. How many of you are going to travel Thanksgiving or uh, Christmas or, you know, in December? How many of you have tickets that you purchased to travel? I'm scared. I don't feel safe. I don't think TSA is going to watch my back and protect everybody on that plane. So, I mean, we need to, we need to get a plan and we need to attack. And we, we have to decide what that's going to be, whether or not uh, allowing some Syrian refugees in which, you know, two families are slated to go to Indiana tomorrow, and now they've been rerouted to Connecticut because the governor there said, no, thank you. We don't want them here um, just because they haven't been properly vetted. We don't trust the system. So each governor, each state is taking it upon themselves to decide what to do. But the back shot of that, the downside of that is, of course, my liberal friends are saying, here you go. This is another example that Republicans are racist and you don't care about the downtrodden and the religiously persecuted people. So it's uh, the Democrats are going to use this to their advantage and paint Republicans once again as racists. Yeah, I, I want to be clear. I, I want us to be a humanitarian nation, but we need to we need to look at why we're, we have a humanitarian crisis, and it's because five years ago, Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama failed to lead. They failed to do the right thing, and now we have this problem. And so, what do we do next? As women, I don't know. I think as a, as a nation, what I think we should do is put pressure on other countries in the region to take in these Syrian refugees. Maybe we cut off foreign aid support, cut off arms, um, in order to put pressure on Saudi Arabia and Qatar and these, these countries that really haven't um, helped the crisis at all in Syria and could and have the capacity to take refugees in before we start taking them in. more FBI agents to track these terrorists who are in the country, said we have more, and the Tea Partiers here will appreciate this, we have more IRS agents in the United States than we do FBI agents. If that doesn't make you feel unsafe, it certainly does me. Preston? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Great presentations, ladies. So I have a question. This is a, a first in a lifetime for me to have an opportunity like to ask this question of three, poli four politically involved ladies. Um, 
It isn't spoken of often, but I think it's a serious issue, and I'd like your perspective. I've been told that women, in particular, when they are vetting who they're going to vote for, take a look and see if they're divorced. Now, Donald Trump is on number three. Um, does that make him less uh, trustworthy? And or is this just a, a, you know, a fraud, this question? Uh, I don't know that it's divorce. I think it's what caused the divorce. So, like, my husband's like, there's no way in hell he'd ever vote for Newt Gingrich because he cheated on his wife. I mean, so that's, that's him. I mean, so I don't think it's divorce. I think it's the circumstances surrounding it, which goes to per personal character. It has nothing, I don't think, to do with divorce. And I think that's true for m most people. I just think if you're loyal to your wife, you'll be more loyal to your country. So that's, that's important to me. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think um, it, it goes to character and, and, and the circumstances surrounding, I think, you know, Divorce is so common, most people know and can forgive it, but it's, um, it, it does go to character, and it, character matters, but I think m most women are more thoughtful and, and can consider a person's policy prescriptions and how they're, they're challenging the status quo than to you know, just, just consider that. That's not a single issue. All right, we have one more time for one more question. Um, I know as a millennial, um, a lot of women with the word feminist, it's extremely um, polarizing. How do we rebrand that word as a conservative? Because to say as a feminist, I'm looking for women's rights. Um, you know, I, th I think what happened um, is that feminists, in wanting women to be equal to men, they sort of found every negative thing that a man does and then tried to do them themselves. And so that is where the kind of the distaste for the word comes in. I actually, I, I think the word feminist means exactly what I said it did. I think it's a woman who lives the life she chooses. And I think that we have an opportunity to say, these are the policies that lift women up. These are the women who, these are the policies that free women to live the lives that they choose to live. and. I, and I do think I think the other thing with the word feminist is it it tends to lean towards progressives, um, because I, I think it's um, that that argument has gotten hypocritical almost that a woman who is a stay-at-home mother and and you know raises children is if that's what she's choosing is any less. Um, of a feminist than a woman who chooses to to run for office. Um, so I, I, I understand where, why it's polarized. I don't like, you know, I, I, th I don't agree with the word, but I think that it is very simply at its root a woman who lives the life she chooses. Yeah, I, I'm a feminist Republican. <laughs> I am, and I'm not ashamed of it, and I try and be assertive, and I try to, you know, protect myself and my interests and the interests of my children, of course. And I, I have no regrets about it. It's not an oxymoron to be a feminist Republican. I, I don't see it as a progressive term. I just see it as a strong, assertive woman. I just go back to why are you putting a label on yourself? Ask them, well, why are you labeling yourself? What does that mean? I mean, I don't label myself. I am who I am, and this is what I believe. So we, we have time for a few more questions. I don't have a question. I wanted to just give an observation based on her statement of how do we, who don't want to talk about politics, and even leading into feminism. It's been my experience. I, sorry, Carol knows this already. I voted for Obama in 2008. I was a liberal. And when I look back on the me then and the me now and how did I get there and, and how did I get where I am now and I think one of the biggest parts that our side misses is the putting our worldview through to the minds of the American people through stories through characters living it and in particular for our youth we have failed to reach them that way how many 
how many liberal comedians are there in their, you know, smartphones every day? How many liberal TV shows with liberal characters are there, are they watching? I don't think we have to have a political conversation. I just think we have to put our worldview on display for them to consume through characters and TV shows and comedians that they'll go to. We don't have to come to them. Um, changing the culture uh, comes first, um, and then changing politics. And um, the culture has captured, the liberal culture has captured um, the younger generation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, yes, you are. <laughs> I'd like to follow up on that question. It's all right trying to convince people uh, of a different point of view as long as they're willing to listen. But if we look at the radical Islamists, I mean, their, their state of mind is such that they do not want to see or hear anything that doesn't match their worldview, which is very limited. But the progressives at Ms. U are representative of a younger generation that takes exactly the same attitude, that they do not want to listen to a different point of view. And Heartland runs into that with global warming, where they try to set up debates and the other side does not want to debate, they don't want to discuss it, they just want to call anyone who disagrees a denier. So how, how do you get through to people who do not want to listen? Well, okay, in the case of Mizzou, that was a failure of leadership. That was a failure of the adults in the room. And, and that goes from the parents down to the administrators, <clears throat> down to the teachers and, and, and everything else. So. Uh, you, we have to change our campuses, no doubt. Um, and we have got to, and um, it's, I think it's almost scary for conservatives to decide to go to get a PhD because they're gonna spend a lot of time and money and uh, potentially not have a job afterwards because of the makeup. So as parents who send their kids to colleges, we have got to push back against college administration continually. And I'll tell you what, they do, they, uh, when I, send an email to the Vice President for Academic Affairs of the University of Illinois, I get a response back. Now, probably because I'm a state legislator too, but, but every parent should demand a response back. They should demand it, they should be on their doorsteps, they should drive down to the administration and, and basically have a conversation. And until we I start to vote with our dollars in, these, in, these, uh, in this way, are we not gonna get a change on those campuses? But that was a failure of the adults. Complete and utter failure. People should be fired, not people resigning over that. People should have been fired over that. So um, that's my first part of the question, I guess. Yeah. Now, my nephews go to Mizzou, and I was just there less than a month ago, and not everybody is a flaming liberal, okay? But the ones that are conservative there and lean right or moderate, they can't come out because they're a fear of retaliation. And I even wanted to have some people come on our show and call in, which, by the way, our show is from 5 to 9 a.m. <laughs> AM 560. But they didn't, they, they were afraid. They were definitely afraid. And they're told, you know, sorority girl sisters were told, stay, don't wear any of your Greek letters, stay in your house. They were on lockdown because where they were protesting, Independence Plaza was right next to the fraternity rows, and they were afraid uh, to walk by them. Because they like don't even look at anyone, keep your head down and walk and go into class. That's what they were ordered to do. So, until you know, it's you know, why are we fostering and harvesting these these in a less, you know uh, children? They're they're children who refuse to grow up, and maybe it is because we're coddling them so much. I mean, Obamacare. I have people on my street who live in a mansion who are 26. Oh, I shouldn't. I don't want to. Is this thing on? Uh, um, who are still on Obamacare? And their parents bought them the house. And it's, we're not creating adults. We're keeping children down because we're giving them all these entitlement programs so that they don't develop into adults. I got out of the house when I was after I graduated from University of Iowa because I needed health care. That's what you know, catapulted me to leave because I didn't want to pay $300 a month in COBRA. I needed to get a job that offered me health care. So then I moved to northern Minnesota and started my career as a news reporter that, and that's what did it, was health care, believe it or not. So there's different reasons. So our next president who gets into office hopefully will be a Republican, right? And they can get rid of Obamacare. So and I don't know how I came up with Obamacare from all that, but <laughs> it's like midnight for me right now, folks. <laughs> yes. I get up at 3 in the morning. 
Um, I think I'm just going to I'm going to take this from a communications perspective because that's my my area of expertise. I think that we need to keep. Um, we need to identify, first of all, the opportunities for us. Like Amy said, there are, there, it's not everybody on a college campus. There are conservatives on college campuses. Um, we need to identify conservative professors or professors who are at least willing to teach both sides of the issue. There's a great um, organization called the Institute for Humane Studies out of George Mason University that, that gives these professors tools to teach economic freedom. Um, because it's just not available to them. So if they even are willing to consider it, this that's a great resource. Um, and, and the other thing, we, we also, 64%, 64% of millennials identified uh, a free market system, when it was described to them, a free market system as being the best economic system. So what is it, let's find out, what is it about that that appeals to them and keep talking and, and keep marketing. And I like what Jody said, that we need to mainstream the ideas of, of a free market. And there are movements to to do that. I know you know much more about them than I do. But um, but there are movements to do that. And it is our messaging has a lot to do with yes, it. Yes, it does. One final question. Yes. My son is at Cornell. 96% of the of the professors there are liberal. It was Waters World. I don't know if you saw that mm -hmm. little video. Yes, yes. That Mizzou bumped that off the news, <laughs> where she and I went. And, and then now France bumped us off. So, okay, we just keep on moving the story. But that's the trick, is the kids. I've sent my kids to, to college convicted in their conservative beliefs. And they have held strong, because they left home pretty strong. It, but it is very difficult mm -hmm. to try to get good grades from these professors mm -hmm. when they know where you think. So they kind of lie their way through, kind of give them what they want, then they go home and vote Republican, you know, but. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I. are paying I, their salaries. I'm know? just going to, I don't know what the answer is to that. I, that is very difficult. It is a culture change that we need. But I'm just going to, I'm going to tell you this story about what confirmed my feelings as a conservative. I grew up in Wheaton, so I leaned conservative, but then I did theater for a while and kind of leaned that way. And I, so I, I went back and forth for a little bit, but then I went to NIU, which is very liberal. And all the, I took, I signed up for it because I was a communications minor and I needed the credit, the films of Michael Moore. Oh. And I was mad the whole semester because not, no, none of it, you're gonna, you would have never hired me, would you? Um, I, I was mad the whole semester because none of it made sense. It didn't make sense. To, it just, as they laid out those ideas, it didn't make sense to me. And I didn't have the courage to speak out in that class, but in my mind, it was solidified that that was not me and that was not my values. So, yeah. Real quick, Michael Moore story. When I worked in Detroit, he was a contributor. Oh. And he would come in all the time with that Michigan State hat and the dirty jeans, and he just uh. smelled like, take a shower, dude, <laughs> please. But then we'd have Ted Nugent come in the next day, and he'd bring teach me how to bow hunt on set. <laughs> but yeah, that the, all of have any of you seen his films, Roger and Me, mm -hmm. and Bowling for Columbine? I mean, just complete propaganda, liberal Lying. gobbledygook is what we call it. Anybody? Well, Thank you, Kathleen, Amy, and Jeannie, and thank you for your great questions. Yes, thank you. Wasn't that a, uh, a fantastic, fantastic panel? If there are any um, um, college students watching this live stream, I want you to know that this is a safe space that your professors may not agree with what is said here, but no one is going to be harmed, by, by, uh, and you're not going to be harmed by having uh, different ideas poured into your head, and I encourage you to actually do so. That's what being young and being in college is supposed to be all about. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to bring our second panel uh, up for the evening. The good news is that we're not yet done. Um, I'd like to welcome to the stage the moderator, Hillary Till. She's a world-renowned financial expert who is active in Illinois and national politics, as well as a policy advisor and a great friend to us here at the Heartland Institute. And her panelists, State Representative uh, Margot McDermott of the 37th District of Illinois, Hadi Holan, a Republican candidate for, the state, uh, rep for state representative in District 46, and Jeanette Ward, a member of the Board of Education in Local District U46. Please welcome them all to the stage. OK, 
Okay, good evening. Welcome to uh, the, uh, the second panel on uh, running for uh, political office. And uh, I'm also uh, happy to see a lot of uh, longtime friends here, including from the West Suburban Patriots. Um, and as uh, Jim mentioned, uh, I'm Hillary Till, and I'm going to be the uh, moderator uh, for this panel. And uh, the, um, uh, Jim had mentioned that I'm a policy advisor uh, for the Heartland Institute on uh, financial issues. And uh, um, I do uh, in involved in some uh, um, political groups um, in, uh, in Lake County. And uh, for example, I'm also a uh, candidate for the uh, alternate the alternate delegate slot for uh, for Ted Cruz in the uh, 10th Congressional District. And um, professionally, uh, I'm a principal of a uh, commodity futures trading firm. And it just crossed my mind uh, during the uh, previous panel that I do have uh, one thing in common with the more famous Hillary in uh, both having been uh, cattle futures traders. Um, <laughs> so at least the one thing in common. OK. Um, so I'm delighted to uh, moderate this panel on the ups and downs of uh, running for uh, political office. And uh, we will hear from three women, Illinois State Representative uh, Margot uh, McDermott, and uh, let's see, also um, Board of Education member Jeanette Ward, and uh, Illinois State Representative candidate uh, Heidi Holen. So um, we look forward to hearing from these women and how they got involved in politics and finding out uh, what have been some of the rewards and challenges that they've been uh, experiencing? And uh, I'll introduce each of our speakers. We'll then um, take about 10 minutes on their uh, respective experiences. And uh, at least in about nine minutes into each speaker's talk, I'll uh, indicate that there's about a minute left uh, to wrap up. And so first of all, uh, it's my pleasure to first introduce uh, Margot McDermott. Uh, Margot was a commissioner on the Will County Board until elected in 2014 to the Illinois House, representing um, District 37. And she's uh, running for re-election. And uh, earlier, she was the Frankfurt Township Clerk. And before any of those elected offices, uh, Margot, a graduate of DePaul, spent 30 years as a corporate lawyer with Amico. Margot. Good evening, everyone. My name is Margot McDermott, and I have been a member of the Illinois House of Representatives since January. So let me tell you a little bit about how I got there. My family has always been involved in, in the community. My dad was a member of the library board growing up, and my mom was involved in uh, voter issues. As, a, as an election judge and in getting people registered and out to the polls. So that's always been a part of my life. I can remember stuffing envelopes for a referendum when I was a kid and taking our red wagon with the big packages of all the reasons why, you know, LaGrange. At that time, we still had our, our um, Andrew Carnegie library. Remember those? And um, why we needed a new library. So I can remember going out with my dad with that red wagon. So fast forward, I'm married and I moved to Will County and my husband and I have been involved. I've been married 37 years and for all those 37 years, we've been involved in local Republican politics. As committeemen, uh, he would take one precinct, I would take another because we can't be the committeemen of the same precinct, right? And so from that, um, came being involved in other things in our community. I was also a founder of the Mokina Education Foundation, which is, you know how the education foundations do things that the schools can't afford, buying um, laptops for classrooms or you know other equipment for classrooms, that kind of thing. So from that sort of community involvement, as my kids grew up and left home, and I could see my corporate career winding down because I you know, was in a position to retire, I'm thinking, what's next? And what was next for me was taking that community service that had always been a part of my life up to the next level. So it wasn't like I woke up one day and decided I'm going to run for office. It grew organically out of the life that I had always lived from being a child. And my community involvement just took, came up a notch. So the first thing I did was run for um, uh, Frankfurt Township trustee. And from there, I went to clerk, 
because, you know, township trustees don't do a whole lot. And I was kind of frustrated. I felt like I wasn't really, like it was kind of a false job, you know, without a lot of responsibilities. So, you know, at least the clerk, the clerk actually has a lot of duties. You got to keep all the records. You're in charge of the um, records retention, which since no one had ever looked at any records, they went back to like the 1800s. So there was a lot to dig my teeth into there. And then also early voting. The township clerks are involved in early voting, and that was a lot of fun getting involved with that. Then I had the opportunity, uh, uh, a county clerk um, no, the county board member for our um, area moved to Florida. So I decided, after about 10 minutes consideration, that I would love to be a legislator. Um, I had been a lawyer, and I had actually was planning to run for judge, but then I realized I didn't want to sit all day in a courtroom and listen to people whining at me, that I would really hate that. And so I decided being a legislator would be a lot more fun and ran for county board. And I was right about that. I did really enjoy being a legislator because you have the opportunity to make change and to um, make a difference in the lives of, of the people in your district and in your county. And I really, really liked that. I got um, uh, a taste of that as a county board member. Now, the two years that I served on Will County Board were the only two years in recent history where Republicans did not control the board. So I was in the minority there, and it wasn't as much fun as it could have been, or as it is now that the Republicans have taken over the board again, and I could have if I hadn't uh, chosen this job. So I had a little bit different experience from Jeannie at this point because the person who was my state rep retired after 18 years, and she asked me to run. She said, Margo, you're the only one that can run. You're the only person conservative enough. There were a few of the more um, uh, uh, Republican and name only sort of folks that were looking to run, and she wanted to make sure that they didn't. So she's like, you come, at, you run, Margo, because you're conservative enough, and I know that you can do it. So it, it, it did come uh, pretty organically, and let's see, I've been an office holder since, I think, 2009, you know, so I pretty quickly moved up the ladder um, to the current job. And so because, what I will say about, because I came up through the ranks, if you will, and was a committeeman for so many years, when it came time to run for county board, when it came time to run for state legislator, I had all the committeemen and I had all the markers. I had walked for them. I had gathered signatures for them. I had raised money for them, you know, and, and helped them out. And so they were my colleagues. They were my friends. They knew me. They trusted me. They knew if I said I was going to do something that I was going to do it. Um, and so it was very easy for me to get a lot of support, get a lot of people out running and getting petitions for me, getting people knocking doors for me. And you know, if you're running for an office, um, county board was two whole towns. That's a lot of people. You can't, it's very difficult to walk that all yourself. You have to have allies. You have to have a ground game. And certainly when you're running for um, state legislator, that's 108,000 people. That's a big area. If you don't have some allies, if you don't have some ground game, you're not going to be successful at that. So by coming up through the ranks, I had a lot of support. And I did have, in both those races, I had, for county board, I had a four-way primary. And was the, it came out the top in that. And in, for, for state legislator, I had a three-way primary. Keeping in mind, these are Republican areas, right? So your, your Republican primary is your race. I mean, yeah, I had opponents, Democrat opponents in November both those times, but, you know, it's not. The race really was the primary. So it's very important to have allies within the party that are willing to work for me and support me and go door to door to me, for me. Um, the other thing is you've got to be willing to work hard. I know that other people will say the same thing. You've got to go and knock those doors as many as you can. You can't knock 108,000, but you can knock what I, my goal was to knock some in every precinct. And that was, um, let me think, about, uh, about 70 precincts. So, you know, if, if you can do a few streets in every precinct, you figure people talk to each other. And so, you know, I don't want to uh, downplay how important it is to go out and work yourself. Yes, it's important to have allies. It's important for people to know you and not just be swooping in from the outside like, I'm going to fix Will County. I'm going to fix District 37. It doesn't work that way. You have to, you know, I don't think so, you know, swoop. You have to, people have to know who you are and what you stand for and what your record is. 
And I think that's another important thing, and one thing that has been my strength, and maybe um, I think Jeannie can probably testify to this, and certainly anyone in my district can testify, is, you know, I'm going to tell it to you absolutely straight. And that's refreshing, and I think people like that, and people know that about me now that I've been around for a little while. And so that kind of a reputation I think is very helpful. Is that um, more common in a woman than in a man? Maybe. Um, certainly... Um, I don't see it, I, I get a lot of comments like, nobody ever told us that before. Nobody ever told us straight before. Nobody ever told us direct and truthful before. And, you know, my predecessors have been men and women. So, you know, I don't want to say that only women are going to tell it to you straight. I'm not exactly sure that's true. But I think the moral of that story is you have to be very, very true to yourself. In, if, in 30 years of corporate America, being so direct was not always that helpful. Uh, but in politics, I find it to be very helpful and a strength uh, because people know where you're coming from, and they, I've found it to be people to support that, that directness and that openness and that honesty makes voters want to stick with me. So I'm, I'm going to stick with what brought me to the party and, and keep telling and people very, very directly what the truth is. People are like, nobody ever explained Illinois politics to me like that before. Well, it's, that's exactly what is going on, is, is what I'm telling you. So um, I haven't, I did find in the primaries that men were not expecting me to be there. They were expecting me to let the guys who had been around for a long time be the ones to win, be the candidates. And I just didn't even listen to that. I didn't even know they were there. I was more about, you know, I wanted to run for that and... If there were some guys that were running that thought that they um, should have been the ones slated, then, you know, run in the primary. Beat me. See if you can beat me. See if people like your ideas. See if I'm going to work hard. You know, are you, I'll work me. Uh, you know, and they weren't willing to do that. They thought that because they'd been a precinct committeeman too, that somebody should have just given them the race. So, you know, try to outwork me. You know, they haven't, they haven't challenged me yet, so we'll see. <laughs> So, I, and the other thing that's important and, and really wasn't mentioned is, you know, it really is important to have your family with you. And I think some of the guys would say this as well. If your family's not going to be supportive, because uh, politics is very time consuming. My husband ran for office a few times, not successfully, a long time ago, and is my biggest supporter in my races. He's like, Margo, you're the only one that can represent us. You're the only real conservative in this race. You know, you go. And he's out there working just as hard as I am. He's really supporting me in Springfield. It's not easy to be down there. Some days are really, really hard. And he's like, you know, super supportive. So I think that's really important, too, is you, you do, it's really important. And I think some of the guys would agree. And we're seeing a few guys not coming back this year because their families are like, you have little children, you need to be here and not in Springfield. So, and they're listening to that. So you, it is important to bring your family along with you on this trip. I'm going to leave it at that. I'm not sure if, how I am on time. I think I'm probably closer over 10 minutes. So, As, and I think I mentioned at the prep that I could probably talk on this topic for two hours. So I'm going to stop at 10 minutes and I'll be happy to answer questions. Well, I, I look forward to hearing more from Margot also during the uh, Q&A. So um, now I'd like to uh, introduce um, Jeanette um, Ward. Um, Jeanette's a uh, West Chicago resident and was elected to the Board of Education in uh, School District uh, U46 uh, this year. And uh, as a parent volunteer, um, Jeanette has been critical of the district's standards-based grading system. She also advocates um, for um, pushing back against uh, Common Core and also the uh, park testing. And uh, Mrs. Ward is also the regulatory affairs manager at an international um, chemical company. And so I look forward to uh, hearing uh, Jeanette's experiences. I have to say, that I was reluctant to enter into politics because I have two young children and because of the nature of our political discourse today, which is quite divisive, particularly 
if you disagree with liberals, I found. But because I witnessed firsthand the degradation of our educational system and because of my children, I knew I had to enter the fight. This mama grizzly was awakened when I heard from Dan Proft on the way to work one day that U46 had hired a chief of equity and social justice for $134,000, and I couldn't believe it. <laughs> then my second grader was taught recently, or I guess it was a couple years ago, that the primary threat facing polar bears, and you'll love this Heartland Institute, that the primary threat facing polar bears is global warming. The primary threat. Then my fifth grader, she's now in fifth grade, the other day came home not with the Declaration of Independence or the U.S. Constitution. She came home with the U.N.'s Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Did you know you have a right to a salary that's adequate to support your family? You have a right to leisure time, free health care, and free education? And then, <laughs> so this was a good thing. The district did something where they were going to honor veterans. So in, in my children's school, they were to write about or draw pictures of the liberties that they valued in America. But my fifth grader was told she couldn't draw a picture of a gun. So what she did was say that she was thankful for the liberty to own a gun and to draw pictures of them. <laughs> and my fourth grader actually drew a picture of a gun. <laughs> so in my daily work life in the chemical industry, I am used to an environment that is predominantly male. So I'm comfortable interacting with male colleagues and find the experience, for the most part, pleasant. In fact, I sometimes prefer the company of men. No offense to people here, just saying. So entering the political arena, which is predominantly male, isn't a challenge for me, at least not in that way. What is a challenge is being a woman who holds to conservative values and principles. If you're a conservative woman, you will be attacked. Out of seven members on the U46 board, two are male. Of five women, I am the only one who holds to a conservative political ideology, while I would categorize the remaining as progressive or leftist. So board meetings are really fun. If any of you live in U46, I would encourage you to attend them, just for maybe entertainment value. So while my male counterparts hold to fiscally conservative values, I find that I'm usually the most vocal when it comes to the social values being taught to our children through the curriculum, especially Common Core. And because I have children in the district, this Mama Grizzly cares a lot about that. And for that reason, I've had to stand alone on several occasions. The other day, I sent a commiserating note to my dear friend Sharon Angle. I said, Thank you for your principled stand, 41 to angle. This is six to ward. Because <laughs> she, she served on the state legislature where there were 41, 42 legislators, and it was often 41 to angle was the vote. It became the joke in the Nevada, Nevada legislature. I find that I'm somewhat disappointed at what I perceive, perceive to be a lack of courage on the part of many men in our society, especially elected officials, to stand and defend the home and our children. I often think of the biblical character, De character Deborah, who as judge in Israel offered the victory of a battle to the leader of the army who basically told her, no, how about you lead and I'll follow? Not that I blame men, much of their natural role has been degraded in our feminized culture, where the natural aggressive tendencies of our boys, is, instead of being positively channeled, are outright discouraged, particularly in public school. And I find that sad. Because of the current environment in which we find ourselves, it is important 
for a woman to make a principled stand. It is for us to proclaim that the real war on women is waged by a society who encourages women to take the life of their unborn children, while, while an organization profits from the sale of the baby's remains. It is up to us to stand up against the indoctrination of our children when our children are taught that America is the world's barrier to progress and holds no unique exceptionalism in human history and that we were founded by racist thugs. It's up to us to stand against the real bullies who want to teach our children values that are not ours, financed with our money, who then accuse us of bullying when we oppose them. I'm proud to be here with other women who will stand as Deborahs, as Jones of Arc, as Eowyn of the Lord of the Rings fame, as Margaret Thatcher's, as Mama Grizzlies. Let us ride to the sound of the roar and fulfill the purpose to which we were called. Thank you very much, uh, Jeanette. I'm looking forward to a lively uh, question and answer uh, session uh, after, uh, after we finished our uh, prepared remarks. And, but um, last but not least, I'm happy to uh, introduce um, Heidi Holen. Um, Heidi is a candidate for state representative in District uh, 46 and is the Illinois State Coordinator for ParentalRights.org. A 31-year resident of unincorporated uh, Glen Ellen, which is where I grew up, um, Heidi has focused on home educating her two sons and helping her husband with their family-owned small business. Uh, she holds a bachelor's degree in business administration from M Elmhurst College. Heidi. Thank you, Hillary, and thank you to the Heartland Institute for this forum tonight. Now, I'm going to be able to have one opportunity that the other five speakers did not have. I'm the sixth. Now, one remark that has already been said is I normally don't identify solely as a woman. But in this regard, this comment is going to identify me as a woman. I think the stat is, is a woman speaks five words to every man's one. Well, almost everything I already wanted to say tonight has been said. <laughs> so that's my only female comment here tonight. But let me highlight some of those points. And I was taking notes as some of the other speakers spoke. And I could start right with the last one. Um, one of the things that got me uh, into being a candidate for state representative was a Common Core forum. I was attending an event because I was preparing to speak on that for my parental rights duty. So that was an attachment to something she said. But the other thing is, the, question, um, the other word that I've been he hearing frequently is liberty. And I have to say, liberty is one of the reasons I am standing before you. It's why I believe not just women, but everyone should be involved in politics. Because if we are not involved, the liberty and justice that we seek to uphold will be taken from us. And that is why we are here tonight. We want, to, we want to focus in on how we can become, first and foremost, the basic step of protecting those liberties and, and justice for our country is to be an informed voter. And I've heard that mentioned here tonight. Um, and I'm going to come back to that in a minute. And the other thing I heard was challenging the status quo. So I'm going to focus in on those two issues right now because that is a perfect example of the race I had to run. So let me give you a little bit of background on that. A few years ago, as I said, I was living my regular, normal life and attending an event, walking through my life the same way I already been, and someone that I sat next to at this event, after speaking to her for about five minutes, and she happens to be in this room, she looked at me and asked what district I lived in, and I told her, and I told her I had met my state representative, and she said, would you be willing to run against her? Now, I thought it was a joke. I went home. I settled back into my lovely little life until I got a phone call about five or six weeks later. And they mentioned this conversation that I had. And I said, yes, I remember that. And they said, well, would you be willing to speak to us? I said, certainly. I'll, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, I'll help you find a candidate to run against this, my representative. That's fine with me. I'll do that. So I went to this meeting, very relaxed and casual. 
And not only were the gentlemen who had called me sitting there, but also was that person who had asked me. And it wasn't a joke. <laughs> Can I identify you, Jeannie? <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> so anyway. So I proceeded to be what I would consider was a proper vetting for a candidate. Raked over the coals. And I gave clear, uh, as clear of answers as I could. And then when I was presented again with the question, would you be willing to run for state representative? In the back of my mind, I wasn't thinking, they're asking me because a woman. Because you know, that never crossed my mind. Not once, but I will come back to that. Not once. They were asking for other reasons. It was my values and the policies that I would uphold as a result of those values that they were asking me to run for. And that's what I was so excited about. I was thrilled to be meeting with people that wanted to do certain things for our state. And as a result, I said yes. So I stepped into the race as a rookie to learn. I mean, I had helped with campaigns before, but it's one thing to be the helper, and I think Margo touched a little bit on this. It's one thing to be the helper and you learn how to do things. It's another to be the candidate. Within a few weeks, I realized something quite fascinating, and that was that some people only cared that you were a woman. And I started to wonder, does anyone here care about some of the policies that I was passionate about speaking and addressing and solving some of the problems of our state? And then yes, fortunately, there were plenty of people out there too. And I see many of them here in this room tonight because that's, why, that's what binds us. Again, we are here because we want to protect the liberty and justices that our country gives us. So that was terrific. So then I had to, as I proceeded through the race, one of the things that I'm going to address now is challenging the status quo. Because what I was up against was, um, it, it actually is a, an excellent picture of what is wrong with the state of Illinois. And I will mention three things that, uh, the challenges that I faced, and it wasn't just because I was a woman, it had absolutely nothing to do with that, it was because I was up against the status quo. So here are the three challenges. Gerrymandering, campaign funding, and then what I will describe as politics versus policy voting on bills. Now the reason I want you to be aware of those three things is because those are three things that you can take out of here and share with your neighbor. You can be an informed voter sharing something very simple for those who somebody mentioned apath apathetic voters. I'll tell you what, let me bring these right down to the level where they will no longer be apathetic. Let's look at gerrymandering. Gerrymandering, when the legislators choose their voters. You will look at general polls anywhere, and it is always overwhelmingly supported that people do not want gerrymandering. They want fair maps. Doesn't matter what party they're from, they know that if a legislator is picking their voters, it's wrong. So if someone is performing gerrymandering, you should be opposed to it, and you should be opposed to the person that is put in the position because they were, it was a gerrymandered district. My district is a perfect, classic example of gerrymandering. Here in Illinois, in both two, now, let me give you a quick back, back step, just one step. The control of our maps here in Illinois is from the majority in the House, the majority in the Senate, and the governor. For the last two elections, that's been controlled by one party. They've been able to draw the maps to favor them. When you take a look at our supermajorities, the reason they have supermajorities in the House and the Senate, that's not representative of the general population. If you look at a governor's race, a lot of times the elections are about 50-50. But if you look in the Senate, it's 65-35, and the House, it's 60-40. It's because the legislators have been picking their voters. Everyone is in agreement that they don't like that. It's wrong. So my district has been gerrymandered. As a challenger, I have to be able to address that. But you as informed voters can help. All right? Second, let's take a look at campaign funding. And this is also a hot issue here in our state. Um, because it's one of Governor Rauner's turnaround agendas. But there is a case going through the Supreme Court right now as we speak. It's known as the Friedrichs case that comes out of California. And what it is is you have 12 people that are employed by their government that are being forced to pay dues to an organization they do not want to belong to. Now, those organizations 
or that organization happens to be known as a union. It is a public sector union. The reason that's important is, again, like I said, for us here in Illinois, the implications of that, um, of that decision is going to have a strong impact on our state. But the reason these 12 people feel so strongly about bringing this case is because they know what happens with those dues. First of all, they're forced to pay them. And they don't want to pay them because they do not want the representation that is being forced upon them because they do not support the values that they uphold. And here in Illinois, 95% of union dues go to one particular party. And yet we also know that one third of those members would not give that money if they were not being forced by a law that says they have to give it. So in my, one of the things you need to do as an informed voter is say, would you, do you support forcing someone to pay for something that goes against their beliefs? For example, I would be looking at some of my voters and they're saying, I support you and I want to vote for you, but I'm forced to support your opponent because 95% of that money goes to one party or the other. That is something, again, we all agree upon. That's wrong. No one should be able to be forced to pay for something they don't support. The last thing I want to mention is um, part of the smoke and mirrors of Springfield especially. They've perfected it, but it also happens in Washington. And that is the policy, um, a policy vote versus a political vote. I also call it, as opposed to political vote, um, a publicity stunt or a sham vote or a fake vote. What do I mean by that? A um, little bit of background again. Every year in Springfield, all of us know that first few weeks, there's about 6,500 bills introduced in Springfield on average. It's gotten as high as 10,000. Now, I'm sure every one of you could rattle off about 1,000 of those, right? Does anybody even know how many of those go all the way through the process and get signed by the governor? It averages 500 a year. How many of those can you name? Okay, so there's a lot of bills going on down there, and it's mind-boggling, and that's the first step. Again, as an informed voter, most people would think, really, that's happening in Springfield? All right, so let's go back it up a little bit. Out of those 6,500, a third of them are shell bills. Hopefully, as informed voters, you all know what a shell bill is. And then a lot of them just get buried in committee. But what is one of those political bills that I'm talking about? And this is where you have a bill that comes to the floor. It is not intended to pass. It is intended to allow a vote for specific legislators so that they can have a 12-second sound bite on the news or they can have a mailer in the mailbox of their opponent in about 24, 48 hours, and this actually happens. Now, how many people want to say, yes, I support my legislator down there on the taxpayer's dime taking votes so that they can help their campaign? I don't think anybody would agree to that. So again, that's something that you can share as an informed voter. We don't want those things taking place, but that's what's happening. So one of the things, um, that I would want you to take away from this. If you are going and going to challenge the status quo, know a few details that you're going to be up against and make sure you're going to explain what those things are. Get everyone to work in agreement with you. Um, I took, okay, back up again. My opponent ran in 2012 against a man and it was a 15% loss for the man. I closed that gap to 5%. But again, I'm in a gerrymandered district, and I have a lot of forces still working against me. Will we win every race? Not necessarily. But I guarantee if you're able to share some of these facts, explain how if they want justice and liberty to flourish here in Illinois, people need to be informed, they need to vote, whether they're a woman or a man. And so I thank you for this time, and again, appreciate your being here tonight. Okay, thank you, uh, thank you, Heidi. And I, uh, I thought I would kick off the question Q and A myself. Uh, one question I have for uh, Heidi and uh, Margot is, um, how does uh, one cope with at, at this time the what might be called a unpleasant uh, political environment in Springfield? 
This is on. What I found is very helpful is to do it one day at a time. Be and it sounds kind of simple, but it is sometimes stressful and it's very overwhelming because the, the challenges are immense and the crazy is immense. And the, the status quo is, you know, it, it's, if you try to think of the big picture, I, I became paralyzed and extremely depressed. So the best way to, I mean, you have to function on a day to day. I, so the way I cope with it is to think about what can I do today to represent my values? What can I do today for the voters in my district, District 37? If I can do something today to stand up for values and my voters, then it's a good day. So I wake up every morning and I try to think about what am I going to accomplish today that's going to move us in the right direction. And, you know, it's like eating the elephant, you know, one, one forkful at a time. Here I guess it's the ass that we're eating one <laughs> forkful at a time. So that's a, a better way to put it. So I'm going to put it that way. And you just get your fork out every morning and, and pick away at a little part. Thank you. Thank you, Margo. Okay, Heidi? And, and the only thing I can add to that goes back to the original question about the apathy. As someone running for the second time and knocking on doors, and I am passionate about knocking on doors, I've knocked on thousands of doors. Don't be shy about it, folks. Get out there and help candidates. It's a wonderful thing. But they are absolutely aware of what's going on in Springfield, and they are disgusted. They are tired. They are upset. But I think, again, it goes back to you as an informed voter. If you have an answer to explain to them just in about a minute, minute and a half, you'll get their attention that long why this battle is happening and why it has to happen, then you can win that situation and you change them from apathetic to encouraging them to vote again, and I think that's key. Thank you, Heidi. Okay, so we'll um, open up questions uh, from the floor. Hi, I have a question for Ms. Ward. I know this is your uh, regulatory affairs manager of your company. We hear so much about the regulatory burdens that American companies face today. What's your perspective on that? Uh, just a, a quick note. I'm no longer the regulatory affairs manager. Now I'm the product manager. But I can speak to your question. <laughs> it is ridiculous the amount of money and time and personnel that chemical companies in particular spend on complying with the EPA and the SEC. Did you know the SEC came out with a law ca called the Conflict Minerals Rule? And we had to determine whether tin, tungsten, gold, or I forget what the fourth one was, was in our, if it was in our materials, where did it come from? So at my company, we use a tin catalyst, and it's in all our products. It's a catalyst. It's not tin per se. So we had to go back and trace where the tin, where the tin come from, and it couldn't come from the Democratic Republic of the Congo. By the way, that was the SEC's conflict mineral rule. So not only do we have to deal with the chemical industry rule coming from the EPA, but now we got a, a rule from the SEC out of left field. So it, it's astonishing the amount of time th that we could spend in developing new products and being creative and innovative. Hope that answers your question. <laughs> okay. Yeah, definitely. Thank you, Jeanette. Um, thank you. <clears throat> I don't know exactly who to ask the question of, but the, the main reason I came to this was I was invited by uh, someone who's been involved in politics, and uh, I never was. <laughs> and I just want to understand what what it was that triggered your interest to get into politics, but beyond that, how were you able to do it with your family, um, whether they, have, they were young or older? I mean, how were you able to juggle your life so that you could settle in on a political you know, time period where that would be the most important thing for you? I mean, how did you get the confidence to do that? Or you know, how do you feel that 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 started for you? When did it start? Do 
<laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, so for me, it's about the idea. The ideas are what matter. It was never about the politics for me. It's that you're not going to teach my children that the UN's Declaration of Human Rights is the, the rights that should be taught. You're not going to teach my child that the primary threat facing polar bears is global warming. And, and it's, it's, it's like that on the larger scale for me, too. It's always about the idea. And it's about the idea for my husband, too. He cares very much about the idea. And when I ran for school board, he told me, you do what needs to be done. Don't you leave anything on the table. It's six months. You can do it. I'm behind you. And he's a stay-at-home dad, and he is a great man. And he made it possible for me to do it. And I would almost have to echo some of that. One of the reasons, now I've always had certain issues that I've been politically involved with, but, but the parental rights issue was the one that started consuming the most of, my, most of my time, and it was that same UN document. I have to say I could probably debate United Nations treaties um, better than the average person out there because I used to do that on a regular basis, and there are three of them in particular that I'm very well versed on. But the gist of it is the one I was starting with was affecting my family and it was control uh, the government attempting to control family life meaning um, things my kids were going to learn when they were going to learn them and things like that and I draw the line at that I don't believe our children belong to the state they belong to the parents when I started um, running for elected office my children were in high school and college respectively so it wasn't so much of an issue of having small children at home that demanded attention but I do think that politics was always our, what my kids call it the family business because we were always politically involved those poor kids were out at a parade you know every fourth of July every Labor Day until they finally got old enough you know kind of that junior high high school age where they just flat rebelled and refused to go anymore so it always has been something that we did as a literally as a family it was always a family activity and um, it, it's continued to be, and I already spoke about my husband's support, and it's, it's very difficult to do this job. It is very demanding. If, I, don't, I can't imagine a circumstance in which you could be in, uh, running uh, and not have the support of your spouse to do it, and in even the consent and agreement of your kids. It really would be very, very difficult to do that. So no matter, no matter what the ideas or the passion you have to have, because... It, it's not just a weekend. It's, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon, and you've got to have people invested. And one more thing, she just said something key. Being involved in politics doesn't mean you have to run for office. There are so many ways you can be involved. I, I guess I really never thought about it as being involved in politics. It was part of life and upholding my values, but yet they were political issues, and it didn't really matter to me, but that was a value system and a moral character code I was upholding. But, yes, yeah, stepping into running for office does take a lot more out of you, but you can be involved at so many various levels. Do whatever fits your schedule for what time you are and what journey you're on at that time. Oh, one more. One more thing. It made me think of uh, my children also. Um, I had been banned from volunteering from their school <laughs> at one time. And one of the persons who tried to get me to run said, said to my children, you know, if your mommy wins this race, she'll never be banned from volunteering your classrooms again. And they said, you go, mommy. <laughs> Thank, thanks for coming out tonight. Uh, Jeanette is my dream candidate for my school district. So if we could clone you and get, like, seven of you there, a lot of my... Just for my district, one of the 700. So this is my question. I'm, I'm, you're talking about, uh, and I'm not concerned about men or women in the legislature. It's the, whoever's going to, you know, the Chicago model, where's mine? Whoever's going to get what I want with less taxes. So specifically, three bills that come to mind is uh, banning lion meat, shark fin, and tanning beds, which our uh, minority leader was her prime uh, goal. So do you have any thoughts on that? And why are, are, why are we messing with this stuff? Uh, 
Can you say political, Bill? <laughs> Quite frankly, it distracts from the serious issues that we need to deal with. It truly does. And it's a pet project, and they're going to push it, as l and, and it avoids dealing with the real issues that we need to deal with. <coughs> Distraction, smoke and mirror. There's a lot of that kind of thing going on with, and especially this year has been, I mean, I wasn't there in prior years, but it seems to me that this year in particular, because we didn't really deal with the budget at all, or or pension reform or school funding, which were the big three as far as I'm concerned. And we, we spent a lot of time on, you know, uh, extending the marijuana test and I don't know, what other crazy things were we wasting our time on? Um, oh yeah, the eyelash bill. Yeah, that came to my committee. Should we regulate eyelash extension um, appliers? Oh, and we had two competing bills by two members of the uh, majority party on the baby bumpers. And oh, we, the, the what? Oh, the, I don't think we had hair braiding this year. That must have been a prior. We had the eyelashes this year though. So, you know, I understand that, but I, I would like to see us do first things first. If we want to get to some of that other stuff after we have a budget and after we deal with school funding and pension reform, that would be good. But that, you know, we're not the party that controls the rules committee and what comes out, so. How outspoken can you be in Springfield or on school boards? Where is the line? I'm pretty outspoken. And I have to say, this room is a delight. I never get this. It's <laughs> I, I only get hatred where I am. <laughs> but it's, it's about the idea for me. So, and, and for me, it's, I'm not looking to do anything after this. I ran, and this is what I'm going to do. And I'm going to be as outspoken as I want to be because that's why I ran. And I'm not looking to the future. I'm looking to get something done right now. I'm going to say exactly the same thing. I find that it's not hard at all to be outspoken. I've been enjoying it. I'm planning on being even more outspoken on a going forward basis because it takes a little while. I've only been there since January. So it takes a little while to understand the ebb and flow of how things work on the floor. And so I find that as the session's been going on, I've been talking more and more. And being outspoken and self-confident has never been an issue for me. It's just a question of understanding what's coming up and, and when's the time to jump in and, and, and be effective. So I have some big plans to be even more effective. One of the things that we hear so much, and I, you guys can test me on this and see if I hold to my promise, is we're always hearing, it's just so irritating, on, we're doing this, this is what we hear from the other side of the aisle, we're doing this for the children. All right? I, 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 it's, it's really, our, if, if, you cared for children, you wouldn't have mortgaged their entire future. You wouldn't have bankrupted their entire future. You wouldn't have them, um, you know, having our developmentally delayed children being supported at the level 51st, because we're, we're not even doing as well as Puerto Rico. So I'm planning to challenge that statement every time from now on. Not going to let that pass. Not going to let that pass. And. If you would be willing to supply me, because, uh, you know, it comes up a lot, so I need a lot of sound bites. So send me some. You know, I mentioned a few. And they were talking about, we were talking about child care funding, right? And so my question was, do you, do you know the average lifespan of a child born today in Illinois? Which I happen to know because I looked it up is 89 years. So I challenged them last week on the floor. The bill that you're proposing today, that you're supporting today, we can't even fund that bill for 89 days because there is no money to pay for these huge child care subsidies, is there? And so I love being outspoken. And 
on the floor, it goes out, everybody's talking, everybody's negotiating, and you get virtually no response. And, the, you know, there are lots of eye rolling. But there's a, what I found is that there's a lot of people listening, and when I come back to the district, people are like, when you said that, you know, and, and just bring up something that I said. And I don't know if that's been your experience, Jeannie, but I find that I get a lot more response from my base at home, from my voters at home, from other conservatives in the state who pay attention to what's going on, then you, you get no response on the floor. People just, you know, it goes over, and you don't think that anybody's listening, but actually there are a lot of people listening, which is encouraging me to want to jump in more. And one more thing is, if you want to wonder about being outspoken, all you have to do is watch the video of them on the floor any day of the week, and I'll believe you, you'll be yelling at the video. So don't worry. You're gonna, if, you, if you were down there, you're going to be hitting the speak button and then talking. So, Okay, we have time for uh, one more question. Well, I just wanted to thank you all and mention that the major issue, of course, despite all of our concerns about the children's education issues and so forth, is that you were just alluding to a second ago the budget and the retirement program and if you those of you were who were at the Heartland Gala a couple of months ago uh, were treated really to a wonderful trip through history when uh, Don Devine was honored for one of the chief achievements of his career which was to overhaul the government pension program and save it from the disaster that we are in in Illinois. So there, there is a plan and a program and a process that apparently can resolve these things. And I think we could perhaps do a very well by looking back in history to what Devine and Reagan did and perhaps introducing those concepts. Okay, I think, um, I know we didn't get to uh, all the questions, but uh, hopefully some of our uh, panelists won't have to uh, leave right away. And uh, I will turn things over to Jim Lakely. You ladies are dismissed. You don't have to stay here for me. <laughs> what a night. That was a fantastic program. And I, I, let's have a, a round of applause for all of our speakers and our moderators tonight. And I hope you enjoyed it uh, as much as I did. And as, as Hillary mentioned, um, maybe there'll be a little bit more conversation uh, before we uh, call it a night for sure. I hope you learned tonight uh, what we hope to present to people out here in the suburbs and to all of Illinois, and anyone who will come, and that this right here, this office, this space, the people here who think the way we do, our library, this is the headquarters for Liberty uh, in Arlington Heights. This is the place where you can come and learn and listen to people and get energized and get informed. I am more energized and informed. I want to take back our country, not from, you know, in the way that it's, it's spun, like take back from whom? What do you mean? I mean take it back for Liberty. I mean take back our country and restore the Constitutional Republic that our, that, our, that our ancestors gave to us and trusted us to protect. And it has been slipping away in our lifetimes in this room. And so you can come here to the Heartland Institute and you can tell your friends that they need to come to events here at the Heartland Institute so they can get energized, so that they can get informed, and that they can, and they can also help all of us restore the Constitutional Republic that is our inheritance and that is slipping away. Um, I also want to thank, before we go, our, again, our sponsors, uh, Turning Point USA and uh, DuPage uh, County Libertarians and uh, the West Suburban Patriots, who are just great friends of ours here since we've moved out here into the northwest suburbs, uh, the Illinois, Il uh, Illinois Opportunity Project, and um, AM560, The Answer, which almost goes without even saying, but thank you for being here. And oh, I'd be remiss. We are a nonprofit organization, so on your tables and on the, on, the, on the table as you exit are these envelopes where you can join and become part of the freedom movement here in Illinois and nationwide and globally because supporting the Heartland Institute um, supports restoring the Constitution, supports restoring the liberty that we are owed that belongs to us 
and to restore that. And it starts in places like this. It starts in think tanks. It starts on the ground in political uh, activities, as you've heard about tonight. And I really hope you will uh, come again and become a member of the Heartland Institute. We have a little bit more refreshments. I could be convinced to open up another bottle of wine, but somebody's got to be really nice to me. Perhaps bring an envelope. I don't know. We will see. Uh, but we're not going to throw you out of here. Uh, we want to be good hosts. So thank you very much. Mingle. And please come back again.